Pod Nation, how are you? How you doing? Welcome to the Potty of Slave Podcast. I'm here with my homies Anthony and Tony. How you guys doing today? Too many Tonys, man. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Good to see you guys, as always. Are are we part of Pod Nation? You guys are. We are the Pod Nation. The okay, youth good. Of the Pod then Nation. I'm, then I'm good. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Anthony here. What's up, guys? We're not that young either, which is sad. But... I know. I subtract the youth, the yeah. elderly of the nation. I don't know. Uh, middle aged. Middle aged. <laughs> best day of the week i say it every time but it's true you know tough times good times the patio slave is kind of like the homeostasis of nerdery <laughs> i love it it's true it's so true though like it's something to look forward to uh this is what 87 now uh it's it's yeah. pretty wild we're coming up on that 100 mark which is really kind of crazy to me uh you know and, and man like we just keep grinding these bad boys out and it's always fun like i've never thought of it like oh man i don't want to do that it doesn't sound like fun tonight. It's always been something that I'm like, yes, let's go. Let's get this thing going. Absolutely. And the listeners don't know the juggling act that goes on behind the scenes to get these pulled <laughs> off. It's like it's like the guy that can juggle. It's like you look at him and you look, oh, he can juggle. But behind the scenes is a lot of practice and stuff. Well, well, we don't practice, but to get all of us on the same schedule is wild. The fact that Not it's happened. Not to mention two different time zones, right? I mean, Yeah, it's it's crazy. But we're here. These guys are being polite. I'm having technical difficulties down here with connection issues, all <laughs> sorts of stuff. So yeah, it's it's a multitude of different things. But yes, it is. We're not production. mad at you, dude. We're not mad at you at all. This I is nothing to do you. with you. This is this is as I've I said to uh, <laughs> my wife and I stayed in Portland the other night to uh, go to a concert, and uh, I said to the concierge at the at the hotel, I was like technology is only as good as it is, man. And he was like, yeah, you're fucking right. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I swore. And I was like, don't worry about it. I've, I've been where you are. Trust me. And now he uses that same line. <laughs> Hopefully. Actually, you know what? Before we get into the main segment, who'd you see? I mean, we know, but tell everyone else. Yeah, it was City in Color. I, I mentioned it uh, uh, last week, I think. Uh, we finally, we saw them. So amazing show. Oh, well, damn, it was just Dallas Green and, and, uh, we had another guy with him playing for about half the set at the State Theater in Portland, uh, October 24th, so Sunday, a couple weeks back. Just an amazing show. Uh, so cool. I had never seen uh, City in Color. I always wanted to. Uh, it's a great room for it. Sounds are great in there. Uh, you know, check our uh, – Nate Nate did a, a video on our Instagram back on IG. Check our IGTV. That's where you'll see it from when Nate saw him on the same tour in early September, I believe. So really worth – if you get a chance to see that band, go see it because he's got such a great voice. And, and translates brilliantly in any type of theater. Like I, I saw – you uh, provided some videos to him, but some of my other friends posted videos of that show online and – you could tell the crowd was just encapsulated the whole time, just dialed in. You could hear people singing in the background, and that room is perfect for him. I, I saw him there a few years ago. Really, any theater, any bigger than that, it'd be a little different, I feel like, but translates very spot. well in that house. And I saw your sister, Tuan, so said hi to her for a minute, which I hadn't seen her in a while, which was, it was cool to see her at a concert again because it had been, it'd been quite a while. I mean, we went to 311 together, but before that, it was like, I'd see her at all kinds of shows. Yeah. And then with the pandemic and not having them, I've seen her at two shows in the last two years. So And on some nerdery to too, right? Vinyl, oh, posters. Yeah. It's vinyl, the poster. Ah. Yeah, I, I storied the poster if anybody saw that. But man, that – and it's a, one of 510, I believe. So it's one of those uh, limited edition tour posters that I'm pretty stoked that we have. Uh, nice. I love that stuff. And you just brought up a good point, Twan, that he's like perfect for theaters. Would he do a arena tour – I'd probably not go yeah. just because it's not fitting for that type of music. So that's an interesting point. He would have fit outside at like uh Thompson's point though. That would have, yeah, it depends on the venue would... and that holds more people, right? That's hold that holds like, I want to say like six to 8,000. So yeah, but his style, like down to like the graphics is so like retro looking. It's almost like the optics of his marketing fits. It should be theaters or, and or clubs and mm -hmm. that's it. Right. It's like a, I don't know. I don't want to say hipster, but you know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. But lots of fun. Shouts to the concierge dropping F-bombs to customers. I, I didn't care. I thought it was funny. Um, and I was like, I'm not going to write you up. He's like, thank you. I'm just having one of those days, man. <laughs> like, it's all good. We've all been there. We're We've all, all there, yeah. There. I, I saw Brian Fallon is coming to the State Theater. He's getting out there touring. He'd uh, he'd be a dream guest for us. So if you know him, yeah, right. reach out, hook it, hook it up. Yeah. But yeah, so we... Uh, 
we have an episode tonight dedicated to one band. Who are we talking one band about? Only. Third Eye Blind. <laughs> talking about Third Eye Blind. Uh, yeah, uh, we've hinted at them, talking about them in the past. We've talked about them on an episode way back on our three album run episode, which was what, like, it was the week after Greg, so episode 10, maybe? So it had to be over a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, it was early. It was early, early in the pod's uh, life. And we did a three album run. And I think Anthony had Third Eye Blind for the first three records. And I had Third Eye Blind for like the middle three. So we're going to take a look at the entire catalog right now uh, and, and just kind of put it in place for us. What, what we think about it, what we like about it, what we maybe don't, uh, and, you know, what, what we think is their best record. Um, and we're just doing the seven studio albums, right? Yep. Seven full length. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so we're not going to do EPs the and, yeah, yeah the EPs won't be in there. Yeah, it's going to be similar to the Foo Fighters episode where we look at the the full catalog, count them down. Actually, even similar to the Spose episode. So why don't we start with like our our thoughts on the band? I know for me, obviously, it's super special band. I'll talk about it in a second here. But Nate, what do you where are you at with uh, Third Eye Blind? Uh, Third Eye Blind, it's one of those bands that crosses over so many different you know styles of music, different times in music all of which we were part of in terms of fan base. And uh, for a while, I think at one point, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, maybe I'm thinking out of context. It seemed like it was one of those bands that you had to be ashamed of liking. I think there was a phase there at, the, at some point, yeah. but I never felt ashamed of it. I was like, this is an amazing band, amazing music, transcends so many different parts of music history. I mean, they came out in 1993 and they're still going. It's insanity. With some other changes along the way, though, right? <laughs> They're not all the same. Lot, it's yeah. mostly Jenkins from the start to finish. Yeah, a lot of lineup changes and whatnot, but just amazing songwriting ability, sing along songs, song progression, all the stuff we learned from Greg, right? Different ways of writing music. Now more than ever, I think I've never been a bigger fan of, of Third Eye Blind than I am today. Um, and I think this deep dive on the band has brought that has elevated that appreciation even more so. So that's the good thing about these deep dives is you can kind of really realize like you're a fan but no you're really a fan because i know all these songs by heart it's insanity what about you guys yeah i i agree with just about everything you said there as well as you know it, it brings you back to a time and a place certain songs i mean I'm, we've all heard semi charm life a million times but I, i'm still not sick of it like it's yep. it's just such a great track and there are probably a hundred of those throughout the catalog that you're just like, wow, this is a really great song. I didn't realize how good this song was. So if, if anybody's coming to this thinking they're kind of a one-hit wonder, or like I know those songs from early on, you know, Jumper and semi Charm Life and stuff like that, you're doing yourself a disservice. Go check out the rest of the catalog because it is phenomenal. There, There is no missteps. There, you know, there might be a song here or there. You're like, all right, not my favorite, but on the whole, man, it's such a great catalog. And we'll get into that obviously here in a bit, but it's one of my favorite bands ever. Uh, I've had, you know, a chance here and there where I wasn't like listening to them as much. And they've always brought me back with good music. Like, Oh, they put that out. Oh, I should check that out. Oh, wow. I love this. Oh, I want to go see him now. And, I, and then I go see him. So, you know, that's, it's, they continue to do that. And even up to this new record that just dropped a couple about a month ago, a little over a month ago that it's again, I want to go see him again. I want to see him play these new songs live because they just continue to do that for me. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you guys just said. And and I, I'll, I'll say this. This is a matter of fact, easily top 10 band all time for me. I, oh, yeah. I just, the catalog is, very few bands can touch it over that time period. But when, when we were, you know, talking about doing this episode, I was thinking a few things came in mind. One is, I remember getting into them when I was like 11 or 12, when Self Titled came out. And at that age you you recognize all right i like this song it's got a great harmony it's got a great melody it's you know great song uh, song structure it's catchy and you kind of leave it at that and then as i get older and i'm starting to dive into lyrics it's like shit well it's all that plus lyrics it's like now it's a whole different ball game and if you like i remember that like turning point where it was like jenkins is like a madman savant genius of a lyricist that it's not overly complicated there's not a ton of metaphors it's it's pretty direct and it's just in a lot of ways relatable regardless of your age so that was like one revelation i remember having over the years that i kind of came back up with another thing i was thinking about 
actually as recent as like today is who the hell are Jenkins influences? Because these songs are all over the fucking map. And then it hit me. It's like, it's literally right under your nose. They're in the lyrics. He references Bowie and Ziggy Stardust yep. and Coltrane and Elliot Smith. And even in, um, the kids are coming. There's, there's a reference to black flag. I don't know if it's the band black flag, but it's just all those artists that are mentioned are universally accepted as being great. And it, it's no surprise that he's into them because the end product of Third Eye Blind is fucking amazing. It's just crazy. Totally. And, and I'd love to know even more who he's into or who he listens to today. And I bet he's got a fucking badass vinyl collection. Oh, I'm sure. And I mean, they got early on in the pandemic, he was doing uh, Instagram lives from his kitchen. Remember? Yeah. Like his, uh, yeah. The porch. Yep. And we talked about it a ton. Like it was one of those things saying, like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to sit in front of my phone for the next half an hour, throw it up on my laptop and watch him or him and Chris Reed do some Third Eye Blind songs because it's better than what else I was doing with the pandemic going right. on right now. Right. Like there it was one of those, like, here's a, li- here's a life preserver. <laughs> like Enjoy some live music right now. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and songs, you know, and love and still sound good through a phone on Instagram. It's crazy. You brought up a good point, Juan, as well with the lyrics being somewhat direct for the most part. And I think, and I may be misspeaking here, but I think he was the Vela Victorian at Berkeley uh, in creative writing. Yeah, I remember hearing Something like that, something to that degree. So therefore, you know, he definitely put it to use to the extreme. I mean, one of the best bands, I think we all collectively agree, lyrically and musically, but it really proves the point that less is more like you don't need to disguise lyrics. You don't need to make it some kind of confusing mystery, put, put the song picture to your, you know, put it together yourself, figure it out. Um, it's very direct, but simplistic, but the delivery on the songs a- along with the musical landscape is so yeah. digestible. It's so easy. And it's like pop, you know, it's very pop friendly, but it also has that, like he screams in songs and there's that rock element that's probably coming from things like black flag. It's like, it really is like the perfect, you know, mix up of just so many different styles of music. And for some reason it was like a top 40 band, but it makes sense, right? I mean, it's it does. easy to play that those songs on the radio. So, well, yeah, those first handful of singles were absolutely massive too, which helped. And, you know, at the end of the nineties there, you know, this is a little pre new metal. So alternative rock was still kind of a almost college radio rock type music was still big. And this, you know, semi charm life just kind of blew up, and it, we're still hearing it today, right? I mean, it's timeless. It's twenty, almost twenty, what four? Yep, twenty four. Twenty four and change, or whatever, and it's timeless. We see it in movies still. We see it in TV shows still. I remember seeing it in every movie. You know, in the late nineties, early two thousands, it just reminds me of American Pie. Like when they're all hanging out at yep. the end of the movie, it's like, oh man, and it's yeah, it, it, they're they're timeless, and this is why you know, and we're gonna get into the catalog, so. Uh, we with that said, are we guys are we ready to get into the catalog here? What we drop drop our number seven record? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Do who it. Wants, do it. Who wants to go first? Nate? Me? I, I can go. Yeah, you do it. This was hard, and I, I we listened to all of this this past week, and seven doesn't mean it's bad, right? I mean that's exactly. that's a caveat for all of this. It's like these are these are all really great, and I, I, this album will probably be higher down the road when I've listened to it more. But the new one, our band apart, I I love it. I've listened to it probably 10 times since it dropped a month ago. Uh, it's it's really good, but there's just so much coming in the catalog that that I like more. But man, like there there's some some bad I love Box of Bones is the that was a lead single, right? They they dropped Box couple, of Bones, yep. A couple months ago. Funeral Singers is great. That's one of my favorite tracks on there. And uh was it Dust Storm? I think Dust Storm is really good too. Dust so. Storm is great. Yep. Yeah, it's you know, it's kind of Right in my wheelhouse, Third Eye Blind. It's a little chiller, I think, than some other 3EB records, but it's so good. And it, it's seven for me just because it hasn't been around as long as the other stuff, and I don't have as much history with it yet, but I could see this jumping. I could definitely see this jumping up. Nate, do you have the new one at seven? I do too, and it's. It, I feel like I'm falling into a pattern when it comes to this, that the most recent album is Dead Last, and I think you make a good point, Tone, that it's not based on... The content necessarily but a lot of it has to do with you know just time spent on the album itself i mean you got to think like we were just referencing third eye blinds history they came out in the 90s so the amount of time that i've spent with the first half of their catalog 
is immense. You know, it's been circulating in my head in different scenarios throughout a good part of my life. So new stuff is going to take a while for that to get grandfathered in. So yeah, for me, it does take the, uh, the last spot number seven, but it's not based on quality and I'm still, I'm still getting into it. What I did notice about the album is it's a lot softer. Uh, it's a lot slower than, uh, what I come to realize with, with third Eye one, which is full on rock band. I think a lot of people forget that they are a rock band. They're not a, just a pop punk band or a pop band. And so I didn't expect that with this new release. I thought it was going to come out of the gate strong, like, uh, some of their previous releases, but this, for the most part, even like the opening tracks, like you said, is very like somber. So, uh, yeah, it takes, it takes seven, takes the last spot today. I think we always say like, this could change next week. And this might be definitely the case for me. So I, I don't have it at seven, but I will comment that it made me think like at this age, I equate it to like friends. It's like, it's very, it would be very difficult for a new friend to infiltrate all the history I have with all my friends right. I grew up with. It'd be very difficult. With that said, I don't have this at seven. I have it a little higher, but I will, oh, wow. I, I will echo that this is a little, it's short too. There's nine songs to it. So there's not as many songs to hit, to hit right? You know, it's mm-hmm. like how many swings at the plate are they giving you? They're giving you nine swings. Well, some of these other albums are like, 13, 14 songs, so there's more chances for it to hit. So with that, I'll segue into mine. I have, I have Screamer. I, uh, I Again, we're going to sound like a broken record. Similar to the Kanye Foo Fighters discussion we had where like their seventh best album would be a lot of bands' best album. And I can oh, definitely yeah. say that. So this dropped in, what, 2019? I remember listening to it a couple times back when it dropped. I liked it. You know, music nowadays moves so quick that I didn't spend a lot of time with it. I I listened to it maybe two or three times, liked it, and kind of moved on. When we said we're going to do this episode, I listened to it back and uh, listened to it several times, and I really, really, really liked it. I think it it's got uh, "Turn Me On," which is great. "Take a Side," "Kids Are Coming," a lot of great songs, and it's definitely more upbeat than our band apart for sure. This is one that. Hey, revisit this in 10 years and it'll be interesting to see if I like Screamer better than like our band apart, for example. But it's solid outing with, I think that was the first one with their new keyboardist. So that, you know, Mm -hmm. they've always been a band with, you know, it's kind of different band dynamics going on. But yeah, Screamer 7. I love the visuals too. I love the pennant on the cover. Just cool vibe. 7 with an asterisk that it mops the floor with like, most bands out there is best album. And I mean, let's let's be Good honest. Point. How many bands get to seven? Yeah, this yeah, is their seventh exactly. album. Like, what do you want from the... Or this right. this was their sixth, sixth album. Yeah. yeah. yeah, With a bunch of stuff sprinkled in there too, right? It's not just... Yeah. There's a, <laughs> there's a couple EPs and other, other one-off songs and then live records and a to be doing of. it for this long. Yeah, right? Yeah. right. A best of with other tracks. Yeah, exactly. All right, so we're up to six then. Yeah. I have Screamer at six. Good so segue. I'll jump right into it. I um, I had tickets to see them like, I want to say like a week after this album dropped, and had to eat them because work got in the way. And this is one of those like in 2019, 20 before the pandemic is like, ah man, I can't go. I'll catch them next time they come around. 2021, Tony is like, man, I should have just gone to the show. No shit. Work is not going anywhere. Like you could have seen them at Hampton Beach, the night that, or you know, a week after they dropped the record, two weeks after they dropped the record. I like it. I listen to it a lot. Uh, I own it on vinyl. Like I think I own, I own just about everything on vinyl from them on purpose. And uh, yeah, it's I'm with you. Those songs are great. Uh, the kids are coming is great. I like the title track. It's a little different for them. It's kind of a rocker to open the record. To open it, yeah. It's cool. It's got like some voice modulation stuff going on, which is cool. It's got Alison Krauss on it, which is cool. Then like a song like Two X Tigers. I, I think they have to be at this point in their career to do a song like that. And it's like their it's Jenkins hip hop song. And exactly. it's yep. kind of cool. Like I was listening to it again today. I was like, man, all right. I forget I know I, I had heard it a couple of times obviously prior to that, but hadn't put the uh, the microscope on it like I was doing this. And I liked it. I was like, this is it's a departure. It's I think this record on the whole is kind of a departure for them and it gives you a couple different feelings that you wouldn't typically get from a third eye blind record but also gives you that third eye blind feel so without really changing too much they do give you something new which it's kind of why i like this record so yeah six for me screamer 
One thing you said, which made me think is, I think collectively Third Eye Blind, across the seven albums, they haven't gone too much off the reservation in terms of, Mm -hmm. it's all Third Eye Blind, but, but at the same time, this probably doesn't even make sense. At the same time, the albums feel different, you know? Yep. Yeah. And probably that single song on this album is the biggest departure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because they, they have rock songs, they have more uh, acoustic songs, and then there's kind of that, right? Right. But towards the end of the record, like, let's let's give them something funky. Let's give them something different than we would ever do. Yep. yep. And we're not going to talk about We Are Drugs a ton, but We Are Drugs does that too a few times. Yeah. That seven song EP that they put out in, I want to say 2016, maybe before Screamer. And yeah, it, that does it too in a couple spots. And then there's a couple straightforward th- third eye blind songs that are awesome. So to, to try something new, be a little different, but also still keep your essence. It's hard to do. And especially when you've been going for 30, close to 30 years. Yeah. I mean, you guys took the words that right, pretty much right out of my mouth in terms of where I stand. Oh, then we're done. Cause... We don't have to do this. We're, good night, everybody. <laughs> we had a good time. Good night. It's been a good <laughs> time. We'll, we'll, we'll finish the just episode. Kidding. Tone and I. <laughs> Sorry. Peace, just get Nate. Peace potheads. Um, <laughs> yeah. Screamer number six for me too. And like I was saying, uh, you guys took the words pretty much right out of my mouth. The standout tracks that I had were pretty much all the same. And I actually had two tigers highlighted for that exact same reason. It's like, you know, Stephen Jen- Stephen Jenkins is using auto tune in this song. That's a departure, but it's maybe kind of fitting for the time. I'm trying to like rewind to 2019, like the pandemic hadn't happened yet. I don't even know what the sound was in 2019. Um, and it goes to your point that like, every third eye blind album kind of has a different sound. Is it really fitting for whatever was going on in that time? I don't think so necessarily. I don't think he even needs to do that, but you know, what do you do as a band? Like, do you, do you stay in the same lane all the time or do you switch it up? So this is a good example of a little bit of both, um, especially with that track. I don't think I spent a whole lot of time with this similar to what you were saying, Tony, like I didn't spend time with it when it came out. I knew that they were touring. They were coming through here. I didn't even check out the record, but I was going to go to the show and then the pandemic rolled through and uh, the show was postponed. So I think the album dropped 2019, but the tour was until 2020, something like that. And the date was like, I don't know, March 8th, right? Lockdown was like March 7th. For that reason, you know, this album almost got shelved. And I, for this for this episode, kind of gave it another look and uh, took six because I was a little bit more familiar than the most recent release, but... With that said, it was a little bit more distant from what I appreciate from the band, but I still think I always blame it on myself. It's just a matter of me taking more time with the album itself. So maybe I should do what you do and just buy everything on vinyl. So I have to listen to it front to back. Yeah, somebody spin that shit. Yeah. (laughs) The solution to life's problems, just buy it on vinyl. Yeah, pretty much. And the start of other problems. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. financial financial ruin. (laughs) If we were to have a fire where I live, I, I'd be out some serious cash. So. Damn. Get insurance. Insure that shit. We have some insurance. Yeah. We do. I just don't know if we have enough. <laughs> right. All right. So I'm going to round out the sixes. Yeah. I mean, I just basically have these two flip-flopped. I have our band apart. Like we said, it dropped like about a month ago. Nine songs, so it's short. It, it's almost borderline not a full length. I mean, I was reading up mm-hmm. on it in... They were going to drop it as an EP, but my guess is they probably did enough of that. They were like, you know what? We'll probably add a couple songs, make it a full length. Uh, I love this. I think it's timeless, classic Third Eye Blind. Most uh, like what you guys said, mostly softer stuff, um, less upbeat, but it just it just kind of hit me. There's no bad song on it. Did you guys like Silver Lake Neophyte, that song? Yes. not as, Probably not as standout as some of the other stuff, but yes. So is it just me or is that like sonically the unofficial part two to motorcycle drive-by oh yeah good call listen to that with motorcycle drive-by ears on and i was like transported back i was like man i i actually wish silver lake was a little more epic like like longer and maybe different lyrics but musically and melody wise i was like that this sounds like motorcycle 2.0 which is a brave task if that was the intention you said Dust Storm Tone. I love that song. Mm. It reminds me it reminds me of the Smiths, sonically. Mm. Mm-hmm. And yep. uh, Time in Berlin, killer closing track. I think it's just a killer. brilliant album. And, you know, I would say, I always say this, context is king. The context here is, this is their seventh album with 
a, almost a rotating cast of characters besides Jenkins and Hargreaves. Like, mm-hmm. it's amazing. And it, I, I think for me, that tells me how much the band, how, how, how big influence he has on the band and his brilliance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. But yep. yeah, our band of part six. Yeah, I could see this one climbing my ranks too because there are some, there are some really great tracks. And you're right, I think, I think Silver Lake Neophyte does, putting on just listening to it while you were talking, putting on my motorcycle drive by uh, ears. It does. Yeah, I could hear that. I definitely could hear that. All right, this is where it gets tricky, guys. The top five. Very. Yeah. I, very. It was kind of like a game of musical chairs, but I struggled with this for like a week, and I'm putting my stamp in the in the cement like this i think this is where i will land even a week from now two weeks from now a year from now like i think this is where i'm at so who's up nate or tone i think it's me this is hard man i have blue fourth or fifth excuse me i have blue fifth which they're like six all-time third i won songs on this record can (laughs) i I make a comment yeah i do too do you yeah yeah nate do you too do we have a I don't. Three. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. You yeah. Go. So, go I have it. I have it five. I mean, opening track. Anything's great. Wounded might be a top five third eye blind song. I love uh, Wounded. I. It's always stuck in my head. It's. I, I listened to it with my wife yesterday. I think I listened to it three times. It's like, oh man, it's just so good. There are just like one or two songs on here that that knock it down for me. And that doesn't make the the record bad. I love the record. I think it's, it's an awesome follow up to their first record there. It's not like they had a sophomore slump where they just put out one amazing record. And then we're like, Oh, what do we do now? We don't know what to do here. No, this, this picks up where the other one left off where self-titled leaves off. It's not quite as, as good as self-titled obviously, but man, it's, it's got some just all time tracks. And I, I remember listening to it a lot when it first came out and then listening to it a bunch, like, 10 years later when I kind of got back into the band a little more and being like, man, I didn't give this enough time the first time around. And now obviously today I've given it a ton of time because the band has brought me back so many different ways. Uh, But this, yeah. Number, number five blue came out in 99, November of 99 coming up on what? 22 years next month or yeah, this month. Yeah. Bands aren't supposed to follow up their debut smash with another smash and they did i mean this is it rarely happens they did it smash smash singles where this one falls short for me is it's front loaded i never really spent a ton of time with the back half and now nowadays i rarely put this album on because the first half is largely singles like 10 days late never let you go deep inside of you the replay on those, it's it's good, good to great, but it's not self-titled singles replay for me. So I often end up skipping this album completely unless it's, you know, slow motion. But even then it's the instrumental, right, on this, mm-hmm. on this version. Uh, anything in Wounded are all time. Those are, I don't even know where I'd pin those, but brilliant. Collectively, it is a brilliant album. The production's definitely beefed up. I don't know if you guys hear that. Like, like in Ten Days Late, there's the choral singers in the background. Do you remember hearing that? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, would anything like that happen on the self-titled? I just don't think that they hadn't found their footing as much in maybe dabbling with production and things like that. But massive singles, it's just it's too much carried by the first half, which I don't really revisit it. But I do appreciate its brilliance and actually doing some research for this. A lot of people have this as their top Third Eye Blind yeah. album. Which is wild to me. I mean, it, I'm yeah, not wow. saying that they're wrong. and No one's wrong. No one's right. Uh, it's everybody. Everything's subjective when it comes to this stuff. But yeah, I, I, five, man. It, it's That's saying it's something, tough. right? It's, that was a tough <laughs> saying one. saying something. This, that was probably the hardest decision. Yeah. I have a harder <laughs> one for me coming up, but and I still not, I'm still not sure I made it. <laughs> this is going to be... Uh... Extremely controversial now that I'm bringing it out. Uh, number, my number five is actually self-titled. Ooh, wow. Yeah, oh, which obviously whoa, this all right, is... I, I quit. <laughs> wow, this is... <laughs> this, this is obviously this is controversial. our starting point. Too much controversy here. I'm out. It's so controversial that even I'm like, wow, I'm actually putting a 90s OG that far up. Like, that's crazy. 97, so this is obviously when we got into the band. So the first album makes sense. 97, we were middle schoolers, packed with amazing songs. Like you said, more 
uh, earlier, motorcycle drive by, losing a whole year, semi turn life jumper, all like the singles like graduate, just bona fide, amazing fucking album. Like to put it at five, trust me, like I had a hard time. I s- scratched it out maybe seven times, and I was like, "There's just so much good music here." Like we're discussing a band that's so fucking good. Um, this is a very hard task, and to put it at five, especially with my history with this album in particular, uh, is a tough, tough decision. But I put it at five mainly because of my history with the band had progressed so much since then. And I'll get into that later. It's like a two phase band, right? They kind of had two, like almost like a rebirth. And I think that's why this takes the number five spot is for that reason. Now, like I said, I'll get into that later, but amazing album. I got to say it's hard. It, I cringe saying number five, but yes, number five for self title. But the, to be fair, we don't know your relationship with the band. You know, it just, yeah. it hits yeah. everyone different where they are in their life where you know when it just i have it i'm going to save my thoughts i have it much higher but i it's a good point it, it is controversial i think to any third eye blind fan mm-hmm. but i no, bring com- up a good no point. comment i'm gonna no comment you no like comment suppose. Suppose, yeah <laughs> yeah the connotation to the songs themselves exactly. so much yep yeah all right so we've all given five number four my, my number four I struggle with this one too. I flip flop this and blue, and this has, I mean, probably two of my top five third eye blind songs on it. But out of the vein, dropped in '03, May May of '03, so we were just getting ready to graduate high school, which is kind of wild. And it's a great record. But this is another one that I think, like you said about Blue Twan, is kind of front loaded a little bit. And there's a couple of really good songs at the back. I think. Are you looking at my notes? No, but like, you know, when you get to what can't get away and then wait for young souls, that's kind of where it starts to drift off for me a little bit. I'm going to echo that to the millionth degree. Yeah. Yep. So do you have this at four too? I do too. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Shit. We hey guys, we didn't do this together. Just a heads up. Like, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're... I do. I got, I got my notes to prove it. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great record. I mean, I crystal baller and my hit and run are two, my hit and run might be my favorite third eye blind song. Like it's just so good. That like guitar, I just love it. I can hear it in my head right now. I want to hear. I want to listen to it right now. Just even though I've listened to it a thousand times this week, uh, it's it's very 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 good. But the, as a whole, that's where I have it knocked down to four, just because there's more cohesive third eye blind records for me, ones that I can put on and not worry about. Do I want to skip this song? Like, maybe I'm ready for the next one because I like the next one a lot. I don't have to do that a little higher up. What's interesting about this album is I didn't get into it in real time. I did not get into this album in 2003. I would say probably 2006, 2007. I kind of, and I had heard Blinded, I'm sure, and Crystal Baller. Those are what, the two singles? Yeah. Shouts to Steve. My buddy Steve was, uh, and, and you know Steve. We all know Steve. He, yep. uh, he, he's the one that kind of t- turned me onto it too. Like same idea and because of those songs. Yeah. And they're great songs. I just, I didn't get into it in the moment, but it, it is a special album. I mean, they're all special albums, but I think blinded all time song. There's, that's a song that just has like an urgency to it in a crescendo that builds through the verses that just, yeah. I don't know. It, 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 it's a fucking vibe that just puts you in a mood and you just feel like you should be driving in your car with the windows down type of thing. Faster, great third eye blind opener. Forget myself, crystal baller. We talked about misfits. It's great. Can't get away. Uh, I didn't know that tone that um, my hit and run was your all time. It might be. Third eye blind it's just song. so good. I mean, obviously there's other really, really, really great third eye blind songs that we've talked about tonight and we'll continue to talk about here, but I do think it's my favorite. Yeah. And, wow, man, that's, I couldn't even, well, actually, I do, I think I do know my favorite, but after that, it'd be very difficult. But, uh, yeah, it, it does slow down. It, very similar to Blue. Uh, maybe they should have sequenced these differently, but, man, the, the, it's tough. But, I'm yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to change it. Four out of the vein. That's good because you just talked about it. So we're going to leave. Yeah. Yeah. I know, right? <laughs> the ink is dry. <laughs> just kidding. It's my one. More. That's more controversial oh, no. than Nate's. No. Uh, yeah. Out of the that vein. Would be, that would be controversial. Out of the vein one. That would be controversial. Well, get ready for Nate. No. So much boy. controversy. Oh so boy. much controversy. What's Nate My got? number four. My number four. 
alluding to what I said earlier, because they're higher up, but still hitting number four, amazing album, dropped 2015, Dopamine is my number four. Great fucking album. Could be one of the best albums ever written in terms of pop sensibility. Everything is easy. Shipboard Cook, Dopamine, the title track, obviously. Rites of Passage, Back to Zen, Get Me Out of Here. Like so many good songs. And uh, and I say what I was saying earlier, which is this is like the rebirth of the band. 2015, different lineup, different sound, like we mentioned earlier, kind of like a different sound for the band. I love this album. I think it's actually a front to back album. So the fact that it's number four is, is a tough one but I really appreciate it. I think, Tone, you might have got me into this album. I could be wrong, because I think I fell off the Third Eye Blind Wagon a little bit, mainly because they had that first phase and kind of regrouped, it seemed like, around this time. So I didn't even know they had a new album out, let alone still you know, performing, which is always nice, because you realize, like, oh, nice, this band that I've always liked is, is still at it, and they're still putting out amazing songs and amazing music, and they're still touring, and everything's still great. I mean, where was I? I'm a nerd, and I still didn't know what was going on. So Nate, do you, you do you think this is a departure sound wise for them? Kind of, but I think it's more in tune with the fact that it's 2015 and it's not 1997. You know, yeah. So the landscape is different. Their sound is maybe sh- molding around that, but still kind of in the vein, out of the vein. In, oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> in vein with like the sound of Third Eye Blind because they do have their own sound. I think we can all agree to that. That Jenkins has his own sound, his own. Weezer flavor, Blink-182 flavor, like he's got his own lane, which is amazing to be able to do. I don't even know how that's possible today. But yeah, my number four dopamine. That was a tough one. These are all tough, but to put it up at four, I, it should even be lower, but yeah. Yeah, I I love this record. I'm with you. I have it a little higher. I don't want to say too much about it, but I we, we were texting the other night. I was on my way back from our, our buddies and uh, listening to self-titled and caught you know we we asked greg this in the shreducation episode is there are there times where you hear something or you made something up as like a solo and you t- tear a piece of that away and turn it into another song like this happened on dopamine right there's a lyric in good for you that turns into something in you yeah uh, something the in, entire yeah. song yeah. <laughs> so uh, i was listening to that i was like man i forgot all about this holy shit like there's something in you I believe in, and now it's a whole song on dopamine, you know, close to 20 years later. So happens with lyrics too, ladies and gentlemen. You may have a lyric you really love from a song you wrote 25 years ago that you turn into a new song today. You never know when that's I never would have picked so. up on that. You know, and I've heard both both those lyrics, and something in you is an all-time song. And both mm-hmm. of them are, but I'm, I just never made the connection. Yeah, it's a nerdery treasure hunt, as we we said in the text the other night. That's that's what we're here for. We're we're looking, we're dissecting every little bit that we can because we love this shit. All right, I'm stalling. We might might as well do my uh, my number three, right? Is that what we're up to? Top three, baby. This was this was hard too. I I flip flop my two and three a million times because my number three record got me back into the band. Uh, I had taken a break had been listen hadn't listened in a while. Like I said, I, I went from like listening to the first two records a bunch when I was younger. And then kind of a 10-year break and not really paying a ton of attention to what they were doing. And then they put out Ursa Major in 09. And, man, is this not just an amazing collection of songs? I know, Anthony, we lived together not long after this dropped. And we I think we were both at the same concert when they came through Portland and played Merrill Auditorium, which is we a were. very, yep. very amazing-sounding room. Uh, great for this record, uh, the, the tour for, uh, for Ursa Major. Man, this I can't say enough about this record because it got, it did it got me back into the band. I hadn't been listening as much as I was previously, and then they put this out and Bonfire, probably a top five Third Eye Blind song. Yeah, into Sharp Knife, which is probably another top five Third Eye Blind song. Like, it's just so there's so many feelings on this record. There's so many. There are a couple chances there, even lyrically and. I will never not love this album. I am so, I'm I'm kind of, I feel bad that I put it at three now that we're talking about it just because of how much it's meant to me over the years, the 11, 12 years it's been out now. But it got me back into the band and it made me pay attention to the, the stuff that came after. And uh, I'll be forever looking back on this time when this record came out and how much fun I had getting back into a band I already loved. I echo 
<laughs> all of what you said. I'll save additional thoughts because I have it higher. Ooh. Yeah. We finally differ. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Good. We need some diversity here. <laughs> I'm the only hey, controversial. So, so Tuan, what do you what do you have at three? So three, I have dopamine. I, I think that the backdrop that's so important. There's a few backdrops that are so important for this album. One is obviously it's their fifth record, and and this is what they're putting out. It like this is the product. It's amazing. Second backdrop, which you kind of alluded to, Nate, but this was the first album they recorded with a new bassist, guitarist, and keyboardist. And then that's why I kind of poked at it, Nate, of like if you thought like sonically or musically this was different. Like I, if I didn't know that, in fact, I didn't know that until doing this exercise. I wouldn't have picked up on that, that this was a different sound because there were different personnel. I just, I didn't notice it listening to it in the moment or even up to this week, which again, I think that's, you know, the constant throughout all these years is Jenkins. I think he's the, a big reason for obviously their staying power. I mean, like in a physical sense, but this is, it's a true front to back. There are, there's no skips on dopamine. I personally do not skip a song. And I, I rate right through the end, which I didn't realize the last song, Say It, has a spoken word by Kay Flay. I remember we mm-hmm. we kind of yeah. visited her fairly recently. But I think what makes this album super special is it's it's this high ranked and it doesn't have like the big singles like Blue or Out of the Vein had. It mm-hmm. doesn't need those to carry it. It's just a cohesive body of work that, man... I mean, we could do a whole episode on this album and break down yep. the sequencing of the songs because I, I I don't know if I could have done it better. I think there it's, it was very intentional. And man, that those six years they they were cooking in the lab, and <laughs> this is this is the product. It's amazing, and I love I love the name too, dopamine. I mean, that's a word that has gotten a lot of traction with you know social media and online stuff, and it's just you know who better than Jenkins to kind of shine light on that but yeah dopamine Mm -hmm. three fucking love this record it 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 does kind of pain me that it's it's only three because it's so fucking good i know the feeling (laughs) yeah we all share your sentiment yeah great album not my number three my number three was uh mentioned by i believe both of you uh my number three is blue 1999 release and when i was thinking when you guys were talking i think tom when you were talking about it is there's certain tracks on these albums that are so friggin' good that I think it almost ranks higher based on just those tracks in particular. Yep. Whereas, so I'm almost like shying away from cohesive album as a full unit and just zeroing in on those songs and being like, well, this ranks higher because it has those songs on there. Like it's, you know, it's value is so high because it has these songs that almost overshadow other songs. Like it doesn't matter. It's like a three song EP that, slays you know but i actually do like the album this is actually when i got into the band full on the self-titled release maybe that's why it's rated number five for self-titled 1999 is when i actually got into third eye blind like full fan fanboy um they played in portland maine back uh we're all from portland maine so we know the q 97.9 did a the q show or whatever and third eye blind came and they were touring off this record uh, at the Civic Center in Portland. I had tickets and couldn't get to the show for whatever reason, being Damn. in high school, just couldn't get there. Yeah. Uh, peak of their powers. And and it sucks when you're like that big into the band and they're touring off the album that you love. It's It sucks to not be able to make it. But yeah, anything, Wounded, 10 Days Late, Never Let You Go, Deep Inside of You, and Ode to Maybe, Father, like just just killer album. And anyone that knows it listen to this, listens to this, and obviously you guys know that I'm a, I vouch for the 90s all day. I think it's a very important time for music. It's always been an honest time for music. There's a, a lot of money being thrown around, so the production value is always on point. It just seems like a very genuine time in music history that we were part of in terms of uh, fan base. So this holds number three, and I, li- I like everything about the album. I even like the cover, even though I don't really understand what's going on there. But um, yeah, this is Jenkins in his, in his prime, right? They were full rock, rock star mode. So uh, it'll always hold a place. And actually, this had this higher and actually scratched it out a few times, so it holds number three currently. I mean, now I want to move mine up just because of the way you put it together. Like, <laughs> especially, and we've we've said this a million times, but, like, where you were mm-hmm. when the album came out and what kind of connotation that has for you. 
mean, I just explained that with with Ursa Major. Major, Nate just explained that with Blue. Like, if you if it's a record that you like, really cut your teeth with the band on, or recut your teeth with the band on, it, it's gonna hold a special place for you. It's just gonna be something that you come back to because of that. And I I can see why you have it as high as you do. Yeah. And that same concept plays a massive role in my number two. Absolutely nice. massive role. Yeah. I'm going out of order. Give it to us. Let's go. Yeah, and you can't discount that. So my number two, I think Nate, oh, I don't know if Nate said it, but Tone, you had it at three. It's Ursa Major. I, I had got it on CD, and if there was ever an album that could transport you back in time, that you connected with to a certain time in your life, this is one of them. Like, I remember the car I drove. I remember where I lived exactly. I remember who I was dating. I remember my circle of friends at the time. It's an audio time capsule, and I think it's it's just crazy how it can do that. And and I know like you know how there are some smells that can do that too. It's kind yep. of weird an analogy. Like this is an album that that does that for me, which is interesting. And maybe you guys will disagree. This is not a front to back. I think it's very close. I think it's a summer town, summer town away. Yeah, I yeah. I skipped that song. I I've skipped it for a while. Bonfire, all time. Sharp Knife, all time. Water Landing is like a deep cut that, I say, I've said this so much, it, it would mop the floor with like 90% of the band's out there's best song. And it's like this yeah. obscure deep cut on Ursa Major where Jenkins tries to rap. <laughs> right. You know? <laughs> it's, it's a just... precursor to 2X Tigers, but it's not. It's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love the imagery. I love the visuals. Oh, sequ- we talk about sequencing. Sequencing's great. Like, Dow St. Paul, that, that could be a great closer. And then mm-hmm. you hear Monotop's private opera, you know, and it's like, okay, that makes sense. I didn't think that was coming. I think what this means is I just need this on wax now. Do you have it on vinyl? I do. do. Oh, you have yeah. It on- oh, of course I do. I, this one and Out of the Vein were hard to get my hands on, but when they finally repressed some stuff and I, I found them. But, yeah, no, I'm with you. And it's funny, Water Landing, I meant to mention. I love that song. And it's so good. one of the better deep cuts of any band, but – for them it's just it's such an amazing amazing song on an amazing record and that song ends and then you get Dow of St. Paul into Monotop's Private Opera which kind of bring you down right they just kind of close out the vibe which is it's just a great record I'm with you Summertown's probably the only not skipper like I'll listen to it but I like the rest of the record more and yeah you're right I remember it now I wanted it too shit yeah (laughs) but I'll keep it at three but yeah it's such a good record you want to know something crazy Apparently, this is their their highest charting album in the group's career. Wow! Go figure that. That doesn't make it doesn't even almost doesn't even make sense. I mean, this was twelve years after self titled. I mean, self titled. It makes sense that it wouldn't debut, but you'd think the hype from self titled into Blue and even Blue and Out of the Vein would get them there. That's interesting. And then there were six years between Out of the Vein and this, right? And, and oh, there I you mean, go. The music, Maybe that's what it is. It's the height. The music the, landscape changed a ton at that point. So maybe maybe that's part of it. But you're right. This isn't this isn't one of the ones that you would have thought would have blown up the way maybe it did. Yeah, we talk about al- like I've on previous episodes I've I've talked about albums that have stayed in my rotation for years and years and years. This is one of them. And this is often my go-to of their catalog. I'd say it's it's 20 albums that man just creeps into my CD player every month over the last 12 years. Nice. So Ursa, too. That's a good segue because my two is dopamine, and that's kind of what happens to that record for me. If I'm like, oh, man, I want to listen to some Third Eye Blind, I I do find other stuff, too, but I just love dopamine. Like, I, I, I want to listen to that front, like you said, front to back, no skips, great, great, great record that doesn't have, you know, a real break on it for you to be like, oh, all right, I, I, I could skip this. And it's just so well done and i didn't know that they had a bunch of different new members at that point that maybe kind of changed the sound a little bit and i think you're right it does change the sound a little bit but this is a record that i spent an absolute shit ton of time with over the the last six years and it comes back and always finds its way in the car or uh, on a playlist that i'm you know i'm getting on a plane and i need to download something before we go because i'm not paying for the wi-fi all right, I'll download dopamine. That'll get me through an hour like this or 48 minutes or whatever it is. 
And uh, that's, yeah, I, I just love it. <laughs> you said all the songs. I love all the songs. There's, there's no no bad song on here. And I, I gave you the anecdote about something in you coming from, you know, a, a record almost 20 years prior to that. So pretty cool stuff. And, and yeah, number two for me, dopamine. Wow, this kind of goes into what I was saying earlier, the kind of rebirth of the band, new lineup, but Jenkins is kind of at the helm for the most part. So the sound is there for sure. Similar to you, Tuan, my, or similar, same as you, Tuan, my number two is also Ursa Major. This almost was one. It was one like twice and I had to cross it out. Wow. Yep. Amazing album, 2009. In terms of time reference, it's always interesting because uh, I think we reflected on it earlier with me, with Blue, 1999 in high school, like kind of no worries. Like you can appreciate music in its fullest because you literally have no responsibilities. Uh, 2009, we're in like the deep recession, kind of a tough time, tough hang, not as bad as uh, the pandemic. But regardless, uh, Ursa Major came out in a pretty tough time. But the the album is just so friggin' good. Can you take me? Bonfire, like you mentioned, Sharp Knife. Uh, One in 10 is basically a new Pink Triangle by Weezer, lyrically about to break and water landing. Like these are all standout tracks for sure. Number two, I think I had mentioned it earlier. Dopamine was one that tone got me into same with Ursa major. I didn't know that the band was back. Cause like the gaps in between albums is so lengthy that uh, I think I flew into Boston to see the Foo Fighters with you got with you tone. Mm. And you put this on. I was like, Oh shit, third day of line. They're back. And this album is fucking great. Like, it's not like they're just yeah, putting back, out albums back in just a big tour. Way. You yeah, can, came out you can thank Tuan for that because he he turned me on to Ursa Major. Oh, wow. Nice. Well, that's why we're all doing this. The kind of came triangle. Circle. Here we are. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah, you helped Tone. Tone helped me. We're all back here talking about it, reflecting on it. So, yeah, so I was out of out of the loop when it comes to Third Eye Blind. I didn't know they were still a band, to be honest, in 2009. And even in 2015, it's like another gap. I'm like, I don't know why there's such big gaps, but it clearly is a perfectionist thing to – revisit the songs maybe steven jenkins is like ah let me listen to this another three years and if it still holds up i'll add it to the album so i think almost like the way he writes this is just educated guess maybe he's putting a little personal greatest hits together and then it's ready for release on like a chinese democracy type thing with guns and roses but uh this it's album is way, so good. way better than chinese democracy like... way better way better <laughs> well there was also uh wasn't there supposed to be a sister album or some minor that there was supposed that, to they be scrapped yeah they scrapped right yeah. I remember I'd that. I'd love to get my hands on that. Yeah, you know it's brilliant. I mean, what are you doing? Just throw it out there for the nerds. There was even a single off of it, uh, Non Dairy Creamer, right? Oh, yeah. You know, I remember oh, that. Oh, yeah. that was off that? I'm pretty sure. I thought Non Dairy Creamer was later. Maybe it was later. Or maybe it was for those sessions. Song, though. Could be yeah. from those sessions, though. Just shows how much material he's probably sitting on. But yeah, number two, I mean, this almost took the crown for number one. But uh, And the fact that it's this late in his career. And it hits number two is just shows that like we had mentioned pretty much throughout this episode that the guy is an amazing songwriter and uh, this stuff just holds up time and time again. Uh, this is one similar to what you were saying that doesn't leave my uh, record spin collection on a monthly basis. I, I revisit this quite often, especially Bonfire. I mean, that's a basically a police, I don't want to say rip off, but riff that uh, I can hear that just kind of rings in your head. Yeah. Such a great record. Yeah. Are we up to ones? Yeah. I, I think uh, process of elimination here. Yeah. I think. Uh, a- Anthony and I both have both have self-titled. Yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> uh, Nate, give us your one, and then Anthony and I will go on self-titled because we've heard you on it. Okay. Uh, my number one coming out in 2003. Uh, mine is actually out of vein. Um, out of the you, vein? Out of the vein. Out of the vein, which you might have put together at this point. Another kind of uh, time frame where I was – Stoked on the band, still paying attention to what they were doing. I think it really takes the crown based on the songs again. I, th- I think I agree with what you're saying in terms of full length. Does it hold up? But the songs that are tight are so good. Palm Reader, Can't Get Away, Crystal Baller, Forget Myself, Blinded, Good Man. Like They're so good that it could not not be number one for me, especially a song like Crystal Baller. It's just like I could play that song every day for the rest of my life and be like, nice, can't wait to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so in 2003, like you'd mentioned earlier, it was the year we graduated. So obviously it's a very positive time. Yeah, you can, we can't get away from that positive connotation to the music itself. Kind of like no worries, great music, great time, perfect age. It all lined up. So this takes my number one spot. And uh, 
it wasn't even a tough one to decide on. I think this actually, when I first started writing it down, I just put it at one and maybe I'll change that, but I'm pretty sure this is number one. And uh, yeah, made, made, made the cut. I love this fucking album. Love everything about it. Love the artwork. Love the way it flows. And in fact, what you were saying earlier on, on the front loading heaviness of great songs and kind of fading out, I almost think that maybe that's his cadence. Maybe that's the way he likes to put the albums together is like, you know, super pop sensibility on the end and kind of fade out soft towards the end. It seems like that seems to be almost like a uh, pattern. That's it. I mean, that's so interesting because, I mean, he knows, they, they obviously know the singles or at least the initial single. I think, you know, with some of the albums, I think it was l- little experimentation with what to put out. But the, the back halves do tend to be softer. I, yeah. I think I'll agree with that. Almost across the board now that I think about it. Mm, yep. Wow. That it shows the power of time and place, really. I mean, I I would think most people do not have that album at one. No, but I see why Nate does. And exactly. It makes sense to me now. Yep. All right. Do you want to go or me go, Tone? Yeah, self titled, self titled number one for me. And honestly, before this exercise, I probably had it at three, but re listening to it the other night a couple times, I I couldn't help but notice how timeless so many of the songs are uh, from the, you know, big songs, semi charm life jumper uh, to motorcycle drive by to, you know, graduate losing a whole year is a, one of the best album openers probably ever in yeah. alternative oh, rock. Yeah. If not ever, <laughs> like it's just so such a great hit the ground running for a career from a band. How's it going to be? I, I mean, we know all these songs, right? They're all huge. They were all were, permeated the culture in a way that the rest of it has not as much as I love the rest of it. I I couldn't, it was undeniable. I had to put it at one. So I, I, Twan, you probably have similar sentiment, but yeah, that's, Oh, and just as I told you guys, pre I'm drinking wine tonight for God of wine. Cause God of wine is amazing. Great. So good. (laughs) Great closer. Yeah. This is the, it's the mic drop for me. It, this, when we, when we said we're going to do this, this was, I cemented this right at one. I knew right away. This is it. I love this album. We talk about front to back albums on this podcast. What we don't talk about is that tier even beyond front to back where it's, we need to come up with a name. It's the perfection album. It's not once in a lifetime, but you know, they, these type of albums come out once every couple of years. And I think this is one of those albums. The singles have tremendous replay value the, the deep cuts are a lot of fan favorites. The songs, the melodies, the lyrics, it all hits. There's even you know more aggressive tracks for them, like Losing a Whole Year. Like You see an aggressive side of Jenkins. And a little, little factoid with this album, it came out in April of 97. Semi-Charm Life was a single right before that in February, so leading up to it. They got so much traction from the singles that Jumper... I don't know if you guys knew this. Jumper didn't come out until September of the following year, yep. 98. Wow. I knew it was a while. Yep. A long time. And here's a nerd fact. Easter, 1998. I got this album in my Easter basket. I was 12. <laughs> nice. Yep. Nice. Never forget that. I was trying to pinpoint it if it was uh, 97 or 98, and it had to have been 98 because just the timing of, of the release and the fact that they were still – I don't know what the single was at that point, maybe – How's it going to be was big during that Easter time frame. But in Motorcycle Drive-By, it's a top 10 all-time song for me. It's just a a beautiful song that the replay value just doesn't go away uh, after all these years. It's just, it's a perfect album. And maybe someday we'll rank our favorite albums and this will be up. uh, Or yeah, this album will be up there. Yeah, no. And you mentioned Semi Charm Life in the context of it being a single and, and, how long this album kind of had a shelf life because of how great the songs were. Listen to Semi Charm Life. We've talked about it. It's not the happiest song, but it sounds happy. Yeah. Like I we this could be a whole segment. Just songs that the music isn't it sounds happier than the lyrics painted out to be. I mean it's about doing crystal meth, right? <laughs> how do I get back to the place where I fell asleep inside you? I just want to be happy again. I'm not. This sucks. I want something else that, you know, gets me through this bullshit. Drugs would be the thing. It's <laughs> it's kind of wild like when I first heard it at, you know, 12:13, I didn't have any freaking clue what he was talking about. And then no I listened clue. to it at like 20 and I'm like, "Oh, wow. 
this isn't happy at all. And then now I'm 37 and I'm like, yeah, man, he, he had some demons writing that song. And the fact that it is still so ubiquitous and it's still everywhere and it's still such a massive, massive, massive song, it's permeated the culture, you know, more than anything else they've probably ever done. I love that there's that dichotomy that it goes from it sounds happy, but it really isn't. That's cool to me. And I think more that's probably part of the reason it's given for so long is that it's been able to do something like that. Great point. And I think it proves that Third Eye Blind is a lot deeper of a band than most people think about on the surface. They think pop totally. band, saw them in some, you know, blockbuster movies like Clueless, stuff like that. Like you, you hear the, you know, instrumental versions of the songs or whatever. And you're like, oh yeah, Third Eye Blind, like that band that was in that movie, like whatever. And then you, like you were alluding to, the lyrical content of the songs is so dark and so deep that they really are a full on. Uh, rock band, I guess, but it just you don't realize that until after. I mean, unless you were really digging like we're digging deep now back then, which I don't think anyone really was. I mean, '97, I think everyone. I don't know. I'm kind people of people were, but we, we weren't. We weren't our, at our age, but people yeah. were. Yeah, they were. They were probably older. It was pre-internet Different too. Time. I mean, I, do you remember yeah. if the if the CD booklet had the lyrics in it? I can't remember. I don't remember. I either. feel like it might I, have. I, yeah. But that's a that's a whole difference maker too. You know what I mean? If you yeah. if you don't know what the lyrics are, but you're right. A lot of people, this was kind of a surface level band that they liked the singles, and I mean Jumper. I mean, look at the lyrics to that. You know, it's uh, yeah, right. Wasn't gra- graduate was on Can't Hardly Wait soundtrack? Yeah, I think so. Great song, great song. But yeah, Jumper's not happy. How's it gonna be? He's not happy. Like there's there's some, but like there those are pop hits yep like nate said yeah. 297.9 that that was a pop station in maine that for them to be playing that for around the blue the tour of the uh for blue is kind of wild because this these are rock songs about drugs and then killing yourself yep. and they're they're pop songs because they could do that jenkins was good enough and the band around him was good enough to put one thing out there but have it be something completely different and that's probably part of the reason they've you know stayed as long as they have yeah. Another thing too about Third Eye Blind, which is for me personally very interesting, is my fascination with California as a middle schooler and trying to live almost vicariously through the music. So all like the landscapes, I mean, this is a Bay Area band, hearing different stories through these lyrics and just like he was front and center. This band was front and center. It kind of painted the picture for me, at least in Northern California. And uh without the music, without you know, this kind of entry entryway to what everything looks like now that I'm out here, it's like he did it perfectly. And in the nineties, especially, like you said, no internet back then. So like you didn't have any reference point it's music or, or you have, you know, eventually you get out to visit, but that's about it. So, um, holds true to music and holds true to just painting the picture from 97 to, to really present 2021, like still doing it. So that's probably why it holds up. It's just bonafide, great music, great lyricism, everything about it. Even the live show, I think we've all seen them a couple of times. Like, it's it's just through and through a great great band, great collection of songs, and uh, that's why we dedicated this album to, or this uh, episode to it. Absolutely, that that's a good spot to probably wrap, huh? Yeah, it was so tough to do. If for anyone that is maybe a casual fan of Third Eye Blind, go listen to the catalog. I think you'll be blown away. And uh, you know, you might not have the personal ties to the era, but I think you'll appreciate the music. Uh, and even if you're a, a third eye blind, you know, kind of stand, I mean, you can kind of see where we're coming from and yeah, let us know what you guys had for one. I think most will have self title. I have a sneaky feeling, but, um, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. That was a blast. Uh, thank you guys for listening. If you, uh, like us, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Potty Slave, hit us up, email us in the DMS, all that stuff. We, I mean, everything is out there at Potty Slave.com if you want to find us. And we uh, we will be back next week with who knows what. We have some stuff in the hopper. We have some stuff that uh, we want to do. You never know what you're going to get. And that's the best part about this. Great point. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what nerd nugget you're going to get. All right. Relax, Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, On that note. Peace. I'm Peace, Podheads. See ya.